Hans Gilles. <laughs> uh, hey all, I'm Mangelo and today we'll be going through some lighting, post-processing and rendering stuff. Hopefully this will shed a light to the mysterious and often feared part of the art process, especially for people who are not specifically lighting artists. So like this is for environment artists, prop artists, character artists, whatever. And yeah, without, uh, without further ado, let's begin. So, uh, why listen to me? Like, who's that guy talking? Uh, I'm currently a lighting artist at Codemasters, so working on the F1 games. I've, I got into 3D almost 10 years ago by now. I initially started as an animator, then I became a programmer. At least I wanted to become a programmer. Dropped, up to, <laughs> dropped out of the computer science uni, became self-taught. Uh, I enrolled on a local 3D animation college. After that, I got a job at uh, doing ArcViz. So that's uh, the Fatoni studio. And uh, yeah, year after that, I joined Erhard doing um, 3D stuff for games, VR, AR applications, uh, some stylized stuff, some mobile stuff, some outsourcing overall, like lots of stuff. and. Uh, in 2021, I joined Out of the Blue Games, working as an environmental lighting artist uh, on American Arcadia. And uh, yeah, this year I joined Codemasters, and this is my story in short. So let's go. So, why am I doing this talk, right? Uh, why should you bother about lighting your stuff properly and like? Is this going to make a difference if you're, for example, a hard surface prop artist or if you are like enjoy sculpting characters in zebras? So good lighting can make or break any film, game, environment, character or prop. For example, we all remember the most beloved dark episode from the last season of Game of Thrones. So I don't think I need to give you any better example of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, for example, here is a quick and like we can dirty uh, example of me on the left trying to destroy my car scene and on the right actually trying to do my job properly so in this talk we'll go through the various tools and tricks that you can use to your advantage when lighting your assets environments or characters so if i mentioned environments on some parts and i forget to mention characters just know that most of these things apply to every kind of project basically because at the end of the day you're using lighting to light up your scene and to showcase something right there is no film without light basically and uh, yeah hopefully by the end of this talk your stuff will look closer to the result on the right and not on the left otherwise i didn't do my job very well so you might have <laughs> uh, heard of this countless times but here it is again the first things that you, the first thing that you always need to do be, even before you jump into creating any 3d scene or firing up unreal for example is gather references know what you want to achieve before you even open up the 3d software and this will save you trust me countless hours uh, down the line get a list of the assets that you need to make and try to have to at least write down the steps that you need to perform to achieve the said assets or characters or whatever and this is mainly for you to have everything as clear in your mind as possible just yeah just to avoid any confusion right in the middle of your creative process and it will help you immensely get into the zone and just focus on finishing stuff instead of always stopping every five minutes and wondering what you should be doing next If you're following a specific concept or a real life reference photo and you want to go a step further, you can break down all the elements that you can spot, for example, in this uh, photo, gather specific reference for each one of them. And as I mentioned before, break down the specific tasks and steps that you need to perform to get to the final result. That could be a mess, 
so that could include like modeling texturing baking and all of this stuff in between uh, it could be a material so like the research that you have to do the the actual creation of the material or shader and the optimization perhaps that you might need to be to do for that a procedural system like some spline blueprints or for example this this uh, system I was planning to do it with voids or whatever I don't remember the exact name of that and I never got to finish that so hopefully in the future I'll get back to it <laughs> and uh, yeah another example is like uh, every foliage bit that I uh, broke down here these are um, probably yeah these are the green ones so I've got the blockout model, the revisited asset that has proper UVs, proper like detail. Uh, I mentioned the foliage material and texturing or everything that needs to be done to have a proper foliage system in place. And another upside of doing all that is that you will get used to do, doing that early in the process and it will help you down the line to estimate time frames. This will be immensely helpful uh, once you get into more senior positions in the industry because basically uh, as a senior or a lead down the line you'll be asked to actually provide uh, time frames, um, cost estimates and all of that stuff and to delegate that work to the less senior artists. So. After reference, I mean, this is kind of a tangent, but this is one of the uh, most important uh, slides that I wanted to showcase or is, and it's also the most philosophical one. So bear with me for a minute. So what are you trying to achieve with your, uh, with your art projects, right? This is a bit further from lighting, but I really felt that um, it should have a place in this presentation. Uh, what are you trying to achieve with this piece? Uh, are you creating it to improve, for example, your hard surface modeling or your lighting skills? What is the message you want to convey with that piece? Do you want to showcase your satisfaction with someone or the state of the world, <laughs> for example? Uh, as artists, I believe our art should always have an intent and a message to convey. It's all right for the beginning, especially um, for now the reason for you to might be working on that art piece is to get better at one specific hard skill. But as you grow uh, as an artist and as a person, just, just keep in mind that the pure hard technical skills are just gonna be a means to you to get, to get out, to get your thoughts out or into something that you can share with other people. Sometimes we get caught up with in those technicalities and we just lose the bigger picture of things. So to sum up, always start working on a new project by asking yourself those basic questions. Why am I creating this? What are my goals I'm trying to achieve with it? How can I best convey it through the tools and skills that I currently possess and how I can get better after this project? Like what can I learn? And uh, yeah, I, let's just quickly go through them. Uh, these are shortly almost by chronological order with some tweaks but yeah uh, let's start with that one for example initially i started as an environment artist want uh, i want to do stylized dioramas stylized environments and dioramas are the first step usually to achieve like to slowly start scaling up your your skill uh, your skills and the the scale of your scenes basically it's a great place to start so with this one, it was my first attempt on hand painting, so pretty straightforward. On the next one, you can see that it's still a diorama, uh, but in that case, I it was one of the first like full environments that I. S sorry, a moment. I just realized I forgot to turn on the timer. Uh, Zeal, if I run out of time, please do let me know because... No worries, <laughs> I have you. Yes, all right. Uh, so with this one, I just focused on improving my art skills, played around with baked lighting in Unreal. Uh, it was one of the first ones to also uh, allow me to experiment with PBR stylized um, setups. 
and I also got around to like having different shots, different cameras and rendering everything out as a proper environment. Um, yeah, the next one that was a, like a fairly recent one, so but it just uh, not worthy. It was just a collab with a friend. I was mostly responsible on the material uh, rendering and lighting of the scene, so I didn't do any of the models, textures, or sculpts. But yeah, it's like a quick collab I did with a friend. We ended up working together shortly after on a gig, so that was cool. On the same note, uh, around the same time, I also joined the Beyond Extent, one of the Beyond Extent team challenges. Shout out to the amazing people over there as well. I got to team up with a couple of people that are that were technically strangers to me and didn't know, like I didn't know how to work with them as a team. So that was a great learning experience. And we ended up with a nice scene at the end, so that was all great. Uh, this one was uh, one of the biggest scenes that I've worked to date, and uh, like I tried to make everything from scratch, all of the blockouts, all of the uh, the sculpts, multiple iterations of them, materials, lighting, set dressing, everything in Unreal. So that was one of the milestone projects for me, and it actually helped me get my previous job at out of the blue game so that was really amazing uh, then we've got the artisan challenge my goal there was to make a proper exterior environment because as you can see before this without the, that one i didn't have any other exterior environments that were fairly big in scale uh yeah i got a nice piece out of it um and it was the first time that I actually also worked on a concept, on my own concept. So that was also freeing, but at the same time terrifying in a way. After that, we come to this, to the last 12 months, more or less. And we've got some lighting, realistic lighting experiments that I've done. And that was mostly for me to showcase that I want to uh, I want and I am able to do realistic lighting. So that was uh, like a question that usually came up in interviews or whatever, whenever uh, I was, I had stuff till here, right? And they were like, cool, you've got the experience, you've got nice portfolio, but can you actually work on a realistic scenario? And that was my answer to that. And uh, a slight note on that is that these are supposed to be lighting studies. I don't do the modeling with those usually. So these were these were basically experiments for me to to get some work uh, quickly done and uh, out in the world, and hopefully I get some more time to do some more of, the, of them in the future. But yeah. And yeah, the last two lighting studies that I've done were basically focused on character lighting scenarios and uh, car lighting scenarios. So as you can see, I still don't feel like I've reached the stage when I can 100% take the time to do my own stuff. So for the sake of art, but yeah, it's something that I I'm really passionate about and like whenever I'm trying to create, a, like I'm creating a scene, I always want to have a goal in mind and ideally a message to convey. So in more uh, art theory stuff, <laughs> once you gathered your references, your first order of business is to study your target lighting conditions last scenario, right? Is it going to take place indoors? Is your, for example, character in a dark cave with uh, surrounded by glowy mushrooms and emitive, emissive crystals? If you don't have a specific concept at hand, you're free to choose the lighting scenario that showcases your scene, character or prop at their best light. But this also comes up uh, as a negative because you also need to be fairly certain of what you want to achieve, right? So some examples could be direct sunlight, like this one, this is around noon. Uh, overcast, which is cloudy and soft shadows. Interiors with uh, window light, just like this one. Candlelight, bioluminescent lighting, or a sunset, 
like there's countless different scenarios that you can showcase your work and yeah different light scenarios will affect how much uh, direct indirect lighting your objects receive what angle the light comes from how harsh or soft your shadows or reflections are and, and so on uh, once you establish the the lighting scenario you want you need to think a bit more about the story storytelling uh, that you want to convey through your lighting right that was uh, a bare bones example of one of my first environments from a game jam back in 2017 it was super underexposed and i even had to use levels to brighten everything up for it to be visible in the presentation and it wasn't supposed to be a horror game so you get the point point. and yeah i've just placed a spotlight in the middle and called it a day and uh, yeah this is not the best example but it was the most obvious use case i could find from my work uh, and it's simplest form in this scene i'm just using warm colors and a soft volumetric uh, haze to guide you towards the part that i want you to uh, notice the rest of the scene you can see it's low contrast uh, fairly cold slightly out of focus so it can be much more easier for that part of the of the shot to get blared out in your subconsciously and like you can you you're not guided towards that uh, after that we've got sun and sky which is fairly related to like one of the previous slides but depending on the nature of your project sun and sky may or may not play a vital role in conveying the desirable lighting scenario of your scene uh, they are especially important whenever you get uh, exterior environments your sun position will for example uh, should explain uh, your shadow angle the high the intensity of your highlights while the sky itself will determine the softness of your shadows and the overall brightness uh, for example next time you go out on an overcast day notice how soft all of the shadows are and how you mostly get indirect lighting compared to a very clear uh, clear day that that is like around high noon <laughs> those uh, those shadows are will tend to be almost vertical very harsh and we usually try to avoid this scenario because it doesn't showcase uh, your art in the most deserved way but uh, of course this is something that it's up to you this is depending on what you want to showcase so for example if your your scene or game features uh, a desert and you want to showcase how harsh light hits on the ground you can use that those angles or if you have a time of day system in your game you basically have no um yeah no option than to support that and try to make it as look as as possible some other environmental elements that you can use to your advantage is fog mist smoke and dust they're all tools that you can use whenever you desire to and or you have the performance budget to at least uh, to create like interesting environments uh, yeah these usually are tied to the lighting scenario that you're using but you can also like use them on top of uh, what you already have in place for example uh, nope we're not gonna talk about that now i've got uh, <laughs> some examples later on in the next slide and a quick tangent for all our characters character artists out there just so they they don't feel felt out left out wow <laughs> The most common lighting setup when lighting characters is the three-point lighting setup. In short, this includes a key light, which is the main source of light of your character. Then we've got the fill light, which is usually placed at a 90 degree, degree angle compared to your key light. And it helps bring up the shadowed parts of your character a bit. And uh, lastly, we've got the rim light, which highlights the silhouette of your character and separates them from the background if applicable uh, there are infinite variations of this setup and i've got some uh, links at the end of the presentation 
with some uh, yeah some resources about that so definitely check that out and yeah the as previously mentioned the best thing that you can do even when lighting characters is go back to your reference gather and analyze it see find for example a very nice character or portrait lighting setup that you that you enjoy and try to replicate that some of the fundamental stuff that you we need to be aware of is uh, always to check your values and that means uh, checking uh, turning your your render into a grayscale image checking the histogram uh, of your shot and adjusting for example the curves and levels in photoshop just just to give feedback to yourself whether or not your shot is underexposed overexposed and yeah that was this is what i mean by the histogram i supposedly <laughs> did a very thorough breakdown of that yesterday uh but yeah keep a uh, keep always keep an always an eye out for the like your overall values and try not to have under overly underexposed uh, values or overly overexposed values and yeah just to ensure that your image is as readable and uh, has as much clarity as possible Contrast is another tool that we lighting artists like to use in many creative uh, ways. So we've got uh, with with contrast. It's a bit tricky because this is a term that can be used in many uh, many forms, right? There's you can use contrast in terms of the depth of the scene, shapes, mood, composition. So. For our presentation, we're just gonna stick with the color and like value contrast. So this is just one very obvious example of using color as a way to to add contrast to and interest to your scene. We are also using the shape contrast, but yeah, that's out of this uh, discussion. And yeah, like don't discount contrast as it's one of the boldest tool in your belt as a lighting artist to create interesting renders and the it will always help the viewer seamlessly understand and explore without feeling confused of where your focus points are basically and again like this feels like many things that are taken uh from here and there but i assure you that all, all of those things have uh, a very strong relationship with lighting right and basically every artist in my opinion should be familiar at least with some cameras like how dslr works dslrs work what's exposure what is uh, stop aperture shutter speed the iso and how all of those affect each other so what i'm about to say is gonna be an oversimplification of these and i've got some resources at the end of the presentation to if you want to go through in much more depth but yeah basically the smaller aperture you got the clearer your photo will be or uh, and respectively your render right it's the same thing because we're uh, ideally we're using physical camera attributes even in unreal or unity or in your 3d 3d renderer maybe cycles or eve even so a smaller aperture will have cl more clear images but you don't have a depth of field so it's it's very like usually used in uh, exterior photography and whenever you have very much light yeah too much light basically and on the other side of things having a very short very very big aperture very small value of aperture yeah and will mean that you got you get shallow depth of field and uh, you can use it for example, for close-ups, macro photography, or to focus on portrait portrait photography. Uh, shutter speed correlates with motion blur. A slower shutter speed will give you stronger motion blur. 
well, like a shorter shutter speed will give you uh, a very crystal clear uh, photo. And ISO is not really applicable in, in CG at least, uh, because we're not actually working with photons. So ISO came as a limitation of DSLRs. So the lower your ISO, the clearer your photo will be, but uh, the darker at the same time. So you can bump that ISO, especially under night conditions or under very indoors, indoor environments uh, to brighten up your image overall. But at the same time, you start to introduce uh, noise. Uh, this also, the way that we're we are imitating that effect in CG basically is uh, through film grain, which is usually done as a post-process effect. But yeah, this is still something that we should be aware of. And next up we've got, oh uh, yes. Oh, we've got colors as well. So colors are their whole subject on their own and there's already countless information about them, uh, about it out there. I I feel like I could do a talk on colors by themselves, but to be fair with you, like I feel like it's one of me of my weakest areas. So we're not going to be going into much depth this time. So for this scene, I initially, yeah, just to give you an example, uh, started with the idea of having a red grass filled uh, hill and just went along with that. So I knew my like the lower part of my scene, how it would look I like. So I just tried to, yeah, to complement that uh, through the other parts of the image. So I picked the complementary colors that well with, wor work well with uh, my red grass, especially for the sky and the vista planets on the background, but I still have to make, had to make a lot of iterations and experiments lots of different combinations along the way and this is the final result uh, all right so let's just break down the scene in uh, it's like fundamental form on how many lighting elements i've got in there so first up this is without any lights so this is just the emissive elements that uh, that are present in the scene this is with a directional light with no in indirect lighting contribution. So everything was set to dynamic basically and that's the light I get from it. That was before the days of uh, UE5 and Lumen. So things might be a bit better now. <laughs> and uh, especially on the dynamic lighting side of things, right? Uh, but this, this, this way of working is still maybe applicable in some situations because you can finally control your direct, uh, directly lit areas and then go on to introduce indirect lighting. So yeah, basically the next step for me was to just add the skylight and uh, the real time sky capture feature in Unreal UE4 uh, with the typical procedural but physically accurate sky. Sky atmosphere, yeah, I think that's how it's called. Uh, after that, we just add the volumetric fog that doesn't, in my case, using just a typical atmospheric fog would work just fine, but yeah, it's, it can be volumetric depending on your needs. And after that, this is the slide that I wanted to come to when I talked about fog, mist and, uh, like smoke. This is a very important step, especially when working on environments and this is both applicable on portfolio scenes and uh, gameplay scene, gameplay projects, right? Uh, gameplay environments. Uh, you can you can just see how much uh, yes, sorry, before and after you can see how much depth uh, some cloud cards automatically add and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a great technique and usually a very uh, like a very artistic uh, choice to where to place those fog cards and yeah it will help like convey depth and contrast and separate the different layers of depth in your scene cannot recommend enough 
And uh, lastly, I think, yes, almost last, yeah, uh, we've got some local point lights just to showcase the, the, like, the important part of the scene that I wanted to focus on, to highlight basically, so you can see that we've got some very uh, dark spots on the sides, which might be fine, but uh, I wanted the viewer to slowly, like, to slowly explore the scene, especially the middle parts of it. So that's how I highlighted it. I also had some very colorful like grass. So that was one of the, of my ways to showcase that even better. And lastly, yeah, some, just some basic, um, local lights that also combined with some geometry to finish up the scene and yeah, okay, so, and this is the last example I've got as a scene, yeah. So this is just using, I think, a couple of correct lights to get a base of my, for my lighting setup. This is, so this could be your key light in a way. This is some extra key lights just to showcase uh, some of the curves of the car. So this will always depend on like your model. It might be a character, you want to showcase their face. It might be a hard surface probe. You might have to place a couple of extra point lights or rect light, long rect lights to showcase its form and the specular reflections that it can uh, show off. And you can see that I'm slowly building up and trying to fill all of the areas as much as possible just so I don't have any purely black spots that are not uh, easily understood. Uh, at this point I'm done with my key and fill light so you can see like we've got some dark spots all around one pass another pass and then we get to the rim lighting pass so this basically so showcases the silhouette of the, of my object and it's a great way to separate that from the background in this case i didn't have anything complex complex in the background but it still helped uh, give it an extra pop and i am not sure if that's completely visible from uh, the stream but at the end i ended up using some very subtle volumetric uh, spotlights i think they were uh, just to increase the contrast uh, of the color of the car. So basically you can see the car is orange, its compl complementary color is like a teal color. So that's what I went with uh, just to increase the overall uh, contrast of the scene. You can see that you don't really notice it, but once it's there, you really like it compared to just being a black background, hopefully. <laughs> So, and brief mention on post-processing, it's usually a stage that comes after the most uh, parts of the art pipeline, but that doesn't mean at the same time that it's any less important than everything we mentioned so far. So things like uh, bloom, chromatic aberration, lens flare, vignette, film grain, motion blur, play such an important role in the final look of your scene should not be discounted by any means especially if you're doing short cinematics or films, right? Uh, if you're working in film and VFX, this is usually something that is done after the main production stage. So Crystal mentioned a couple of things <laughs> with that. Uh, in games, however, we have the ability to work with these effects at the same time as we're building our lights. Uh, but it's still good still worth it to be aware that these effects are almost always rendered at the very end of the render pipeline of the every engine. So yeah, just keep that in mind before you start doing any crazy things with them, especially early on. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Be careful not to go overboard with those post-process effects uh, in the beginning uh, because what I usually see in like junior, uh, juniors or students uh, do work on their lights is that they have a very post-process heavy look already even though their light lighting is still like very basic. 
uh, having all those effects in place uh, from the beginning will influence how your like actual lighting looks and it can really mess up with your perception of colors and values um, and contrast so be very careful with that personally i usually start off with a clean uh, base post process layer so i disable most of these effects and once i'm happy with my first couple of iterations in terms of lighting i just i afterwards i slowly start to get those post process effects back on and uh, brief mention to color grading as well like i don't have any better like example of that but yeah that's a before and after and with color grading as well know what you want before you jump on that stage check your references once more have a general plan uh, and a mood that you want to convey and this will help you guide in regards on what you need to change and where for example uh, I've got some like cooler shadows and some brighter highlights you can especially see it here like uh, you normally don't get uh, like orange bloom but yeah it is something that was consciously made and yeah you can like you have that power to do it in the engine at any given time just be very careful and try to do it at a later stage once your environment is set dressed it's your lighting is pretty much uh, settled down and you're you're ready to experiment with different color grading uh, looks and a quick shout out to alec because he has some amazing uh, cinematic post-processing uh, blog posts uh, those have been immensely helpful for me to, s to finally start understanding the more nuanced and technical world of post-processing things like how to get your own bloom how to set up your own film grain they were incredibly valuable and yeah definitely give his blog posts a read I cannot recommend them enough and uh, finally yeah You've created your most amazing environment, you lead your scene, you set up all your post process up. Now, how do you actually get the best possible image out of your engine? Because you, we all know that at some point, high res shot in Unreal doesn't do the trick, right? <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, it's really simple. It's just called the movie render queue. Uh, it's a, like what makes this tool very powerful is that you can pretty much set it up so that yeah you, the engine is spamming out the your yeah your render frames at the best possible quality uh don't really pay attention to these specific console commands because things have changed with uh, ue5 and lumen so most of them are deprecated or are not actually doing much nowadays but the point still starts uh you can, for example you can work with medium or high ray tracing uh, settings in your viewport you can use DLSS for example just to ensure that you get a proper uh, performance and you can easily work with your scene and then uh, once you're ready to render uh, everything out you can pump up that screen percentage uh, you can uh, render in high resolution with many more samples and uh, yeah the image quality is gonna be much greater than what you actually see it in the viewport and uh, yeah just a small note that please be very mindful of that specific command because it will basically mean that it, it's, it acts as a multiplier of your target resolution so it will super sample your scene but also it, yeah might crash your gpus in the <laughs> on the way and uh, yeah without going into the technical details and since this presentation was mostly meant to be a th like a th uh, on theory just watch this tutorial these two videos from william foster hope i pronounced that right he's got some great resources in unreal and movie render queue specifically and he goes into way more technical detail that I, than i could ever go into this talk and uh, one last thing before we wrap this up all is well and all um, 
when you work on your personal stuff but you also need to be aware that in uh, the real world and in uh, actual productions there's usually many caveats and limitations uh, you won't always work on the latest and fanciest AAA games pushing the limits of what is possible with game engine game engines sometimes you'll be limited by what your proprietary engine for example is able to output or what the tools you were provided with can achieve usually you have to support older hardware or for example you might be asked to support low-end or mobile devices for example the switch uh, you might have to keep a similar visual target across most platforms and graphic level that's a tricky one especially with um, for example competitive multiplayer games shooters for example uh, you might not be able for example to hide out a couple of uh, or use LODs for a couple of messes because they need to be visible at all times just to ensure fairness for our players so there's always like these small things that we don't have to worry about on personal stuff and yeah you might at the end of the day just don't have uh you have a specific rendering budget and you need to fit all your lighting in there because some other part of the rendering pipeline uh, requires some more resource resources might be that the volumetric lighting system or the uh the tree shader that you're using is much more heavy than uh, you'd expect and you need to save some resources from your lighting pipeline uh, but yeah I think we're almost done I'll, I'll see if I can share up my presentation slides as well just so you can get into, into those links so no, no need to print screen or write them down manually you can also ask me on the expo chat and I can copy paste whenever you want uh, but yeah some great resources on uh, cinematography photorealism uh, flip normals lighting uh, the, yeah the flip normals lighting course focuses I'm pretty sure on characters and portraits Ryan Manning has some great resources on both ex interior and exterior lighting setups in Unreal um, Blender Guru has some nice resources on uh, art theory behind lighting stuff and yeah Peter Tran has an amazing course on cinematic lighting uh, in Unreal as well and it's actually free so go for it uh, yeah that's about it thanks so much for your time and yeah let's see the questions we actually have uh, plenty of time for questions thank you Angelo for your great talk um, the first question is, how did you pivot or change your portfolio when switching from an environment to a lighting position? Huh. I think the biggest, uh, let me find the slide. I think that change happened around here. So it was a conscious change. Uh, basically, I wanted to explore more, more of the lighting side and that's how like I worked on those scenes. I didn't have like, wait, let me read that question again, because I don't know like how to properly answer that. The, the how is easy, basically, because I was already familiar with Unreal and uh, my previous uh, Archivis experience helped a lot because I've already worked on a realistic uh, scenario. I was already familiar with PBR and how to get proper PBR like materials. I just yeah wasn't utilizing that knowledge before in a scene. All right. Um, the next question: biggest mistake people make when trying to tackle lighting for the first time. Ooh, I'm, I'm still making big mistakes <laughs> when tackling lights. Uh, I guess uh, it would just uh, goes to show that people don't really analyze the reference. So not this one. So yeah. Um, people usually don't have a clear uh, reference photo whenever I ask them like what's your reference or 
what are you what lighting scene are you trying to achieve so yeah i think that's straightforward like have your reference and see for example uh, how your shadows look in that photo reference or concept art see how the reflections work on the metallics for example so do you have any specular sources in that concept or photo do you have like clouds in the sky just so like the the yeah the shadows are gonna be softer and so on all right um what makes someone a fantastic lighting artist as opposed to a great or good lighting artist oh, wow. uh i guess it i mean the that's very applicable to any role really that like you need to have that uh attention to detail at the end of the day you need to uh always uh, like have a clear image in your mind on what you want to achieve and do your best to do that and at the same time i think it's also has to do with some technical knowledge but yeah not to a huge extent because um you're gonna end up with some technical challenges in any way especially when working on bigger projects uh so being able to like think of creative ways and to get over roadblocks especially when it comes to lighting for example we got so many overlapping um shadows over here so we need to find a way to optimize that in a way that it won't sacrifice the visual target that we have in our minds or yeah finding yeah i think <laughs> don't can't think of anything else at the moment those are some very tricky questions guys <laughs> uh, sorry, we have more questions uh, uh, how how do realistic lighting setups differ from less to non-realistic setups mm. so in my opinion and from my experience so far usually there's not many differences at least on my personal work i'm basically using realistic lighting values and realistic lighting setups i'm just usually just pushing the stylization in terms of color or like the the intensities and like the amount of lights that you can have uh, for example i might not use the the color temperature on a direction light i might just go for a tint that's basically non-physically accurate but it is a conscious choice and like i do that to stylize the scene a bit more uh the only exception i think would be the tune shading or like cell shaded uh, styles which might need very different and uh, very custom set lighting setups which go like usually on the low uh, low end of the low level of the rendering pipeline so this can get a bit more technical but it's also a great way to get something that is completely unique looking and uh, yeah an eye catcher i don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you create an interesting lighting setup if there aren't many light sources in the scene oh you're asking the wrong person <laughs> I have so many <laughs> lights in my scenes usually. Um, I think start off with uh, the basic lights, like uh, usually that would be your key light, your fill light, and at least one rim light, and uh, s play around with the like the intensity of them, uh, the radius, just so you get like softer highlights or like softer shadows depending on your platform um yeah one great way to optimize stuff usually is uh, especially in, produ in production is to not have them cast shadows so that's usually the big limitation that we get in games so not having that because most lights you just want to use them for their like either direct intensity or uh, direct uh contribution or either their specular contribution 
So see, like, get a list of the tools that you got currently in your arsenal and try to optimize what you what actually affects your your scene in the biggest way and keep those. All right. Uh, how can one light? How can one light a more open world landscape such as uh, the open world kite demo from Unreal Four or Valley of the Ancients, where you focus on the big picture rather than a specific camera angle? Uh, that's a tricky one because usually when you have, uh, I mean, an open world. I mean, in terms of just lighting it or having a dynamic time of day system. Let's say just lighting it. Okay, open world. So basically you got Red Dead Redemption or like Horizon, Forbidden West. Like usually these are using like hand-tuned curves. Um, for example, uh, your sunset is gonna, your sunset sky or sunrise sky is gonna have specific colors that the artist sets up. So you got, we you usually got lots of creative um, tools that you can utilize to get the to try at least get the better the best possible image quality and like visual result for every lighting scenario. It's not always uh, like doable or it's might be impossible to get it perfect every time but what usually happens with uh, like dynamic day, time of day systems is yeah lots of keyframes and lurping in between the these values and ideally custom for example post process uh, settings and color grading setups for every um, like time of day All right. If the time frame is tight, would you directly set up lights and post processing from a time point very early on in the project and stick to that lighting setup for the entire project? What would be your strategies if you really need to entirely change the whole scene and lighting and fog elements, but the deadline is kind of close or too close? Mm. Uh, again, that's really depending on the tools that you've got. So in Unreal, if you set your post-process um, like volumes uh, efficiently, you at worst have, yeah, worst case, you just have a couple of volumes to set up. But uh, I don't have a straight answer for that because it always depends on the project. And yeah, uh, if you got, for example, some uh, material parameter collections, uh, in Unreal, that's a great way to set up like some global shader parameters and change a lot of things uh, at once. If if you need that that flexibility in your work, uh, but yeah, other than that, try to keep everything as organized as possible and um, perhaps try to serve uh, lighting sub levels in an, if you're like if you're working in Unreal. So that way you can just stream the same or similar uh, couple of uh, lighting sub levels that has all the information that you need. So you only, if you ever need to do a change, you can only have to change that one. Um, when would you say someone is over lighting? I don't mean overexposing, but just pushing lighting too far to the point it's distracting or mm. Uh, Did that come through? Because my Discord yeah, just... Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I'm, I'm okay. still thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, personally, I just try to do my stuff with as little lights as possible because uh, the more point lights, for example, or the more yeah light features you add into one scene, it, the complexity of the scene also adds up so it's very easy to for this to get out of hand and uh, yeah i don't have a hard rule about that but yeah if you if you're for example uh, rendering like lighting a prop i don't think you need 20 point lights for example uh <laughs> 
All right, I think that was all the questions, if that was all your answer. Um, yeah, don't have anything else. Perfect, then thank you so much for your talk. Uh, we have five more minutes to spare, so a five minute break for people who also want to uh, hop into the next ta um, talk. And Angelo, thank you for your talk and thank you everybody for you. being here. On to the next one.